Hey, my name is Laura Kirby McIntosh. I'm a mom of two kids with autism, a teacher and the president of the Ontario Autism Coalition. I'm honoured today that the Accessibility Alliance has invited me to interview David Lepofsky, the AODA Alliance Chair. Now before we begin, I should offer full disclosure. David and I met through our respective advocacy efforts and we've now become good friends as well as strategic collaborators. And then in a weird twist of fate, uh, we both got struck this past summer with vertigo and spent time uh, with each other learning to walk, using walkers, racing each other. He totally cut me off, but that's another story. Um, that's true. <laughs> Anyways, we are, uh, we are here today because last Friday was the 25th anniversary of the, A of the birth of the AODA Alliance. Since its inception, the Accessibility Alliance has campaigned tirelessly for the government to enact, implement and enforce a law to make this province fully accessible to over 2 million Ontarians with disabilities. Today is an especially good day to remember this because the United Nations has declared December the 3rd to be the International Day for People with Disabilities. So I'll get started with, uh, with the interview now. Um, David, can you tell us what happened in this building 25 years ago to get this movement started? And did you plan then on, on leading a whole campaign? I had no such plans whatsoever. In fact, we didn't know that day that we would be forming a movement, much less one that would endure and uh, progress forward over 25 years. Uh, people with disabilities come to realize by the by 1994 in Ontario that we, we were facing too many barriers and even though we fought and won back in 1982 the enactment of disability equality rights in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the Ontario Human Rights Code, these rights weren't becoming a reality in our lives. Yeah, there'd been some progress, but as quickly as some old barriers were, were coming down, new ones were, were uh, popping up. And we decided, a number of us individually, that we needed something new. We needed a new law. Well, well, fortunately, around in, uh, in, in 1994, in the last months of the Bob Ray government here in Ontario, uh, a backbench NDP member, Gary Malkowski, himself the first deaf legislator in, in a Western democracy, himself took it on himself to introduce a private member's uh, Disabilities Act. Hmm. It came to public hearings, and on the first day of public hearings, about 20 of us came to watch the hearings. That's why we were here. Yeah. And the hearings were pretty depressing. The, the minister of the day made a speech that didn't commit to any progress, didn't commit to any action, and, and you could feel the blood boiling in the room among us. Afterwards, Gary arranged a meeting room spontaneously. Word got out that we should get together. He got up in front of the group and said, we got to form an organization to to campaign for the Disabilities Act, and, and that's how it got started. I, I didn't know that day what we were starting, and I certainly didn't know that day I would end up personally taking on a leadership role. Mm -hmm. So why have you decided to bring me to today's event? Um, why did the Alliance want me to be the one to interview you? Well, the disability movement involves folks with all kinds of disabilities. When you initially say disability, people think of people in wheelchairs or maybe someone like me who's blind. But the fact of the matter is we deal with uh, and need to include the needs of people with all kinds of disabilities, physical disabilities, mental disabilities, intellectual disabilities, learning disabilities, sensory disabilities, and neurological disabilities, just to name a, a few. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've been leading an amazingly effective campaign for uh, people with autism uh, in this province mm -hmm. uh, as a grassroots, nonpartisan, uh, effective advocacy effort and not only have you and I learned to uh, become friends and collaborated together but we've learned strategy from each other and I thought it would be helpful for this to be a chance for us to kind of compare notes publicly on, on what we're up to what we're trying to do and, and different strategies some of your strategies are, are, are quite different than ours the the uh, the coalition I've had the privilege of leading we we in the past haven't been organizing protests. There's nothing wrong with protests. Protests can be really good. Mm -hmm. You, on the other hand, have and have done it really effectively. On the other hand, you and I and the organizations we lead are both organizations which, on the one hand, have blasted one successive government after the next when they've let us down. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, we've had government after government turn to you or to me or to your, co your organization or mine. Mm -hmm for input and advice. So we've, we've both been in both of those roles and I thought it would be 
uh, it would be a really uh, interesting thing to do for us to be able to have that opportunity to dialogue about it. Well, it's certainly a great honor to uh, to share a podium with you or, or any kind of forum like this. It's awesome. Um, I love the stories that you tell. So I want you to talk to me a little bit about um, how we're doing. Are we on schedule at all for accessibility by 2025? Well, w when we formed back uh, in 1994, we became a coalition called the Ontarians with Disabilities Act Committee. I was its chair for a decade. And we successfully led to get the the legislature in this building to unanimously pass the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, or AODA, in 2005. And that that was a huge breakthrough. And it mm -hmm. set the goal, the mandatory goal, of Ontario becoming fully accessible to people with dis all kinds of disabilities by, by 2025. Now, that was ambitious, but doable. Right. Um, Fifteen years later, with just over five years left, um, we're not on schedule. We're nowhere near close. And uh, you don't have to take my word for it. Under the AODA, the government has to appoint an independent review every few years to take our temperature, tell us how we're doing. Mm -hmm. And the last of those reviews, a government appointed review, was conducted by our former Lieutenant Governor, David Onley. His report, which was delivered to government uh, last uh, January, uh, it concluded, based on feedback from people with disabilities around Ontario, uh, it concluded that, that Ontario is not an accessible province. It is a province full of, and, and this is David Onley's world, where, excuse me, this is David Onley's words, mm -hmm. it, this is a province full of soul-crushing barriers. This is mm -hmm. not a province of opportunity for many people with disabilities. So, yes, we've made some progress. There's, there's no question that because we've been mounting this advocacy campaign, first the ODA committee from... 1994 to 2005, and then the, uh, its successor, the AODA Alliance, since then. Because of our campaign, we, there's no question we've made progress, but nowhere near the progress we need and nowhere near the progress the law uh, guaranteed to us. So talk to me a little bit about the, the barriers that, that people with disabilities continue to face. What are, what are some of the biggest barriers, in your opinion? Well, Here's the thing, barriers affect people with all kinds of disabilities and, and they're gonna hurt everybody whether you've got a disability today or whether you get one later in life and everybody's bound to. Uh, there are physical barriers throughout our society still. This is a province where many of our buildings are ones that are hard to get into and hard to get around. Our public transit systems are full of accessibility barriers and uh, we have a government that keeps building new public transit facilities that are not barrier for even though they say they're going to be. Mm -hmm. We have school systems, uh, our, a school system, a public education system, which is supposed to serve all, but which treats students with disabilities as second-class cit second citizens. Yeah. Uh, principals have the right to refuse to even let one of them into school if they form the subjective conclusion they might endanger the, or be a risk to the safety of other people. Mm -hmm. An arbitrary power with, with no fair limitations. Yeah. We have a health care system that is uh, full of barriers, uh, what, in, including barriers that are uh, n not just physical barriers, but barriers even getting uh, accessible information about what your diagnosis is or what your treatment is or what the medication uh, is that, that you need to take. Right. Um, our, our coalition just yesterday made public a draft framework about how to fix that because it, it, it's our health care system disproportionately is there to serve people with disabilities, and yet... Um, it uh, it underserves us uh, in a significant way. And finally, getting back to David Onley, it, he he. This is our former lieutenant governor has said that the the national unemployment rate facing people with disabilities is not only a national crisis, but a national shame. I remember when you told me he used those words. That's powerful. So when you talk to politicians about these issues, what kind of responses are you getting these days? Well, since we began. Politicians have seen that this is an important issue and that people with disabilities are in all their writings. Yes. And yet, too often when they're in opposition, they're prepared to rally to our side, but when they form government, they, are, uh, they become weighted down with the inertia of the bureaucracy. That sounds familiar. Um, to its credit, when the uh, and we're nonpartisan, we we work with everybody. We we've seen each of the parties 
uh, do uh, helpful things at times and, and uh, problematic things at other times. But when the liberal government uh, was in power under Dalton McGuinty, they had promised to deliver a Disabilities Act before the 2003 election. And to their credit, within one year of taking office, with no experience in this area, they did a, um, an excellent public consultation, uh, got input from, from around the province, came up with a good bill, improved it before the legislature, and got all parties uh, to, to vote for it unanimously in 2005. That's a major accomplishment. But while they got a good start on implementing it for the first couple of years, their progress slowed uh, by 2011 to a virtual snail's pace. And the new government of Doug Ford, rather than speed things up, slowed things down. And it was hard to get slower than it was before the 2018 election. So, so um, while they're prepared to say nice things, and on days like today, the International Day for People with Disabilities, to make, you know, um, uh, grand uh, uh, endorsements of the importance of accessibility and, and to commend our efforts, and we appreciate that. Mm -hmm. The fact is, um, this province right now has no plan, and this pr current government has no plan to get us to tr uh, full accessibility by 2025. They've been so, given. They've been given one. Right. by the only report, but they haven't come up with a commitment to implement that report or a plan on how to do so. So how do you handle it when you're meeting with politicians and they say that we, we can't afford full accessibility because of the, the size of the provincial deficit? How do you counter that? Well, we get a, some ask us that and others, others think it but, but don't ask. Mm. The fact is we can't afford not to do accessibility. Every time we use public money to build a new building, a new transit center, a, a, a new school with accessibility problems, we create future costs because it's going to cost more to fix it when we could have built accessibility in. Mm -hmm. Every time we preclude people, we, we allow barriers in the workplace to remain, we force more people with disabilities to have to go on social assistance and draw on the public uh, purse rather than being employees where they can pay into the public purse. Uh, Ontario wants to trade with the rest of the world, but until we start ensuring that our products are accessible to people with disabilities, there's a market of a billion people with disabilities around the world that, that we're missing. Mm -hmm. And as a tourist destination, until we ensure our, in, our, our, mm. our tourist infrastructure, our community services, our restaurants, our stores, our hotels have proper accessibility, we're losing out on that billion people with disabilities as a possible tourist market. Accessibility is a ultimately a win-win. It's a win for people with disabilities who want the opportunities, and it's a win for businesses uh, who want to make money and want to have a broader employee pool uh, to draw on uh, so they can be economically successful. Okay. So another question I have for you is that, that parents in, in my community who are involved in the autism cuts often get angry and worn out. Some of us were talking about that last night. Um, and they get despondent. How do you deal with those feelings among your supporters and, and keep people motivated? <clears throat> it's completely understandable that people with any kind of disability or family members of people with disabilities can get discouraged because uh, every day of their life they're facing these barriers and it may just seem like th there's just no way to win. Mm. And one of our important roles, yours leading the Ontario uh, Autism Coalition, mine and uh, I've had the privilege of leading the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance uh, for the past few, few, uh, decade or so. The, the, um, the, uh, our job is to both give them hope and give them tools. Mm. And so one of the things that the AODA Alliance has done is to give, uh, and we're going to keep doing, is giving them action kits and action tips so they can, in uh, amidst their, their very busy lives and overloaded uh, resp personal responsibilities just getting through the day, mm -hmm. give them a way to, whether it's to pick up their smartphone uh, and take a picture of a barrier and tweet it out and use the hashtag AODA fail to let people know mm -hmm about the barriers they face or uh, give them opportunities uh, to come to events um, at Queen's Park or whatever it may be, to give them a chance to turn that anger and that frustration into action. And what we've learned over and over again is that this works. This is how we won the Disabilities Act 
uh, in 2005, and that this is how every time we get a roadblock along the way, uh, we've been able to mount campaigns to resist those roadblocks. Okay. Let me shift gears a little bit. Talk to me about the uh, the birthday party at four this afternoon. Will there be cake? I'm told there will be cake. That's crucial. Okay. That is Tell that me. is really important. <laughs> so th this afternoon at at, at four o'clock. Uh, today we're talking public policy. This morning, but this afternoon there's going to be a nonpartisan, all party invited, uh, birthday party for the uh, AODA uh, movement to celebrate uh, not any organization but a campaign that's gone on uh, mm -hmm. for the past 25 years, first to win this legislation and then to try to win its effective uh, implementation. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, there will, be, uh, uh, there will be a cake and the core theme is gonna be sharing the torch, passing the torch to mm -hmm. the next generation of people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not to say that it, you, know, you or I or any of us who've been doing this up to now are going away, no. but rather to say that there are people who may not have even been alive when the AODA was passed okay. or, or when the coalition uh, first formed to, to fight for it, mm -hmm. uh, but who ev every interest and every desire uh, to make sure that this legislation works and that we do achieve a fully accessible province. And that's going to be the core message. And the important, uh, and I believe, encouraging message that comes from it is simply this. We've learned from the climate change movement that young people mm -hmm. are demanding a world when they grow up that is not worse than the one they're facing now, but one better. Yeah. And uh, that is going to be shared and is being shared, that wish, uh, by young people with disabilities mm -hmm. um, who don't want to have to put up with the barriers that we've had to pay, uh, put up with. But this isn't just, uh, it's important to emphasize this, this isn't just about uh, young people uh, with disabilities or people who have a disability. Now, everybody eventually gets a disability if you live long enough. Right. Uh, we're the minority of everyone. So our, our goal is not to turn to people without disabilities and say, oh, hey, what can you afford to do for us? Mm. Our goal is to improve this world so that when people without dis who don't have a disability now later get theirs, they don't have to face the barriers we've had to live with. Right. So talking about the future, what is what is your vision? What are your top priorities for, for the future? Well, our priorities in terms of the provincial government right now um, are these. We want the provincial government to come up with an action plan to implement the only report. It's got a roadmap on how to get us to full accessibility. The provincial government, the uh, Doug Ford government, has not agreed to do so. Yeah. In fact, a resolution was placed before the legislature that should have been easy for all parties to endorse, um, introduced by um, NDP MPP Joel Harden last uh, May yeah. um, during National Accessibility Week calling for that kind of plan to be adopted and the the government actually voted against it and condemned it as red tape that would drive business out of business which is that. utterly false and hurtful mm -hmm. um, we also want to make sure that the provincial government doesn't make things worse we want them to adopt a strategy now to ensure that public money is never used to create new barriers because public money is now being used to create new barriers against people with disabilities. And we also, just in terms of recent developments, are very concerned about other government strategies that have been adopted without regard to our needs and that are gonna hurt us. Last week, the provincial government announced a new regulation to allow electric scooters on our mm -hmm. uh, roads and sidewalks. Mm -hmm. These pose a provable known threat to the personal safety uh, and accessibility for people with disabilities and others. And I, as, just speaking for myself personally, as a blind person, I don't want to face the risk of some uninsured, unlicensed, untrained uh, person whizzing at me at up to 24 kilometers an hour on a completely silent e-scooter on a sidewalk, mm -hmm. which is supposed to be there where, for pedestrians to be able to walk safely, not to be smashed into by, by a fast-moving motor vehicle. Mm -hmm. And that is unfortunately what the province is uh, potentially unleashing on us now. So we're, we're working on, uh, uh, as a major priority, making sure that the current provincial government doesn't create a new series of barriers to our accessibility and our personal safety. All right. Well, thank you for, for all of this. Um, thank you for your leadership in, in getting the Ontarians with Disabilities Act passed. Um, and all that you've done with uh, with the AODA, I look forward to the the party this afternoon, and uh, 
and, and following your activities again in the future. It's important to emphasize, just in closing, that mm-hmm. the, the power of our movement, just like the, uh, uh, the power of, of the, the, the movement that you've been leading, um, is not the leadership. It's, it's the yeah. grassroots folks there across the province. It's the people who are tweeting, who are Facebook posting, who are showing up to events, mm-hmm. who are calling their members of the legislature, who are uh, speaking out in community events, who are, uh, are doing whatever they can to put pressure on politicians, mm-hmm. uh, who are raising this with the media. And uh, I've, I've had the privilege over these 25 years of meeting amazing people. Sadly, some of them did not live long enough to celebrate this 25th anniversary. Some didn't live long enough to see the legislation even get passed. Uh, but our, our, uh, we, we are energized by those folks. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, disability is not limited to any race, to any religion, to any political party, mm-hmm. uh, or to any age. So um, I don't know a politician out there who can disregard the needs of the minority of everybody. And uh, we'll be bringing that message forward. Thanks so much for taking part in this with me today. This was fun. Thank you. All right. We'll call it there. Any questions from anybody? Or uh, just say? one question. Maybe. Sure. Uh, sure. Maybe more. Um, I'm just wondering about the committees that had been set up to propose standards when it comes to accessibility. Um, the government um, had mentioned uh, it was earlier this year that there was work being done on that so I just wanted to get your your take on it do you think the work at those committees is happening quick enough or have it, do you have any involvement with those I could give you lots of information for one thing I'm a member of one of them there's a uh, my coalition had led the fight for years to get the provincial government to agree to uh, develop and enact an uh, education accessibility standard to tear down the many barriers that face students with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Uh, The previous government appointed two committees, one to deal with kindergarten to grade 12, I'm on that committee, and one to deal with post-secondary education. In the wake of the election of the current government, that committee, in fact, all the standards development committee's work was completely frozen, and the current government left that freeze in place for months, we uh, had to lead the campaign to try to get them unfrozen. After uh, four or five months, they unfroze two of the committees um, uh, in the fall of 2018. The um, infor- one dealing with accessibility of information communication, like websites um, and information technology, and the one dealing with employment accessibility. And they, they eventually got back to work and are working. As for the two education standards development committees and the healthcare standards development committee looking at barriers in the healthcare system, they remained frozen. Well, it took the government from its election in June of 2018 till nine months later uh, in March 2019 to announce that they were gonna lift the freeze, but it took them another six months to get the committees back to work. Uh, We're talking about a longer period than it took um, the the previous government in 2003 to develop the entire Accessibility Act uh, from beginning to end and get it, it passed the legislation. This government took longer to unfreeze a couple of committees and let them get back to work. So we're back to work. The work is underway. But those months of delay meant more and more months of inaction uh, on the barriers we face and creating new barriers in the meantime. The other thing I should tell you is that just before the uh, 2018 election, the, the previous government received the final report of a committee that reviewed um, the regulations governing accessibility in public transit. And we have a public transit, public transit system that is uh, sadly replete with accessibility barriers. There have been improvements, but we're not on schedule to make our public transit system accessible. So that committee reported out uh, back uh, just before the election in 2018. It's now a year and a half later the current government is able to implement improvements. It has not done so. It has not announced that it's going to do so. So uh, we're talking about, as I said before, uh, progress uh, under the new government that is even slower than progress over the last months uh, of the previous government, and it is hard to get slower than the progress under the previous government over its last several months. I have a question. So, David, uh, do you have any advice for the future generations of advocates like me and uh, Clara here? 
Our advice to you, and we're going to talk about this at the birthday party this afternoon, our advice to you is the future is yours. Uh, and uh, and I'm going to give you two bits of advice, and then I think we have to wrap up. Mm -hmm. The two pieces of advice are these. The first is your generation are the experts in social media, and social media are the most amazing political tool. We didn't have that 25 years ago. We didn't have that 15 years ago. So take those tools that you know how to use so well and use them to maximum advantage. And the second message I would give your generation is about a fortune cookie I once ate. And let me tell you about this. It was back in May of 2005. It was the day that the AODA was going to be passed. We knew it was going to get it, win the vote. We knew it would be passed unanimously. It was just a formality to come here for that vote. I happened to go out for lunch before with a friend uh, to a Chinese restaurant. I got a fortune cookie. I broke it open and I gave the fortune uh, to my friend to read to me because it wasn't in Braille. It would had to be a fortune cake to be big enough to hold a Braille fortune. The words of that fortune cookie really spoke to the entire movement that I had the privilege of serving, and it speaks to your generation. Let me just conclude with those words. The words of that fortune are, every great accomplishment is at first impossible. That's the message. The great accomplishments are ahead of you, and they may seem impossible, but you can and you will succeed. Thank you very much.